welcome to today's lecture on public policies and private strategies for the digital age. So today we ask one of the most important questions and that is, so what? So we have this digital revolution and, 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 and what, what to do about it? So the two basic ways you can go about it are public policies, private strategies. They are two complementary sides of the same coin, two aspects of the same game. Uh, for example, you can think about it like that. If you think about, I don't know, human development as a sports game, you have the rules of the game and you have those that play the game. And both influences how attractive a sports game is or how human development in this uh, in this sense flourishes. And so, for example, there are the ones that organize the game, the NFL, or the FIFA, the NBA and so forth, and they make the rules of the game and they have a lot of influence. And they're the ones that play the game. These are usually the stars and these are the ones you hear about. That's more like the private sector that really implements the game. These are the Michael Jordans, the Michael Schumacher, the Lionel Messi that make the game attractive and also the one that have most of the visibility in in social systems it's the same way these are the private sector companies and the other ones that regulate the game are more the governments or the policy makers who try to make the rules now they also have a lot of power because they could change the rule of the game and suddenly reduce the importance of one of these private sector players. For example, imagine the NBA would say, well, from now on, you only get a free throw after every 10th foul. Now that would certainly favor some kind of players and not others. Or let's say in soccer, they would say we now play with two goalkeepers. That would certainly favor some and not others. So you can change the rule of the games and, and with that favor one or the others. And that's what you also try to do. You see, is the game attractive? That means does it fulfill the purpose that I wanted to fulfill in terms of human development? And how can it be regulated? And how can I assure that the private sector players can flourish? And they also then reinvent the game and can shape the game. Players like Michael Jordan, Michael Schumacher and Lionel Messi, they surely reinvented their respective sports, they add a new dimensions to it. So it's an interplay between both of these sides. And also when you think about a future career, you can also decide, do I want to be on this one side or on the other side? My personal experience has been more in the public sector and public sector policies working at the United Nations. So many of my examples today will draw from that experience, but it doesn't mean that the basic characteristics and the challenges that we face when we try to look for efficient interventions for the digital age does not also apply to private sector. For example, if you have to work out a strategy for digitalization for your company or for the launch of a digital product that your company has developed. Both public sector policies and private sector strategies do make sense because technologies do not deterministically determine one certain kind of outcome. So even so, we often say things like the internet is the driver of democracy. So the internet is good. Or we say the internet is informational dictatorship because it inevitably leads to complete transparency. Um, the truth is that technology is neither good nor is it bad. It's just a tool, just like the hammer, as I always say, you can use it for something very useful or you can use it to hurt people. Now, that is not the fault of the hammer. It is the social usage of the hammer. But then again, just like guns or atomic energy, they're not necessarily good or bad, but also they are not really neutral. So the logic is more like we shape our tools and our tools then shape us. And both private sector and public sector are involved in the shaping of technology. For example, the public sector very often is financing very basic research. The vast majority of very basic research is financed by the public sector. Just because basic research is so risky that no private sector entrepreneur would be willing to 
spend personal money because you have such a bad return on investment, most often it doesn't work out. So what society actually says is, okay, let's, let's put our money together through taxpayer money and through other things. And then we really finance very basic research where you do not have a very high success rate. And we finance research projects, for example, in universities. And we give them money so they can just explore and they invent a lot of new things. Most of the digital innovations come from the public sector funding, including the internet, touchscreen, voice recognition, and so forth, a mobile phone communication as well. So all public sector funded basic research questions. And then the private sector often picks up these pieces uh, and does a lot of development. So it's research and development. They combine it together, bring up new products, but they have a lot of power to decide as well which kind of products to bring to market. They might do a little complementary research as well to complement some aspects. And there is a lot of power to shape what is actually offered for social diffusion, then the public sector sometimes might see, well, there's some things that maybe are not really in agreement what we want society to look like. For example, maybe some privacy issues and then regulation has been set into place. And the private sector then again is, you know, exploring the limits, looking for new, very innovative, very creative ways that gives really shape to this social evolution. So it's an interplay between these two actors, what we then call you know, the social construction of technology with you and me also playing a fundamental role in this game as consumers and as citizens of democratic countries. Now, when you think about social evolution, you know, you might think about this unstoppable force, this fire that burns its way through history. And how could you possibly shape that? I mean, where, where would you start? It's all of these complexities, such so many little small wheels that turn so many big wheels. How can you how can you get a handle on that? Let's start with the observation that you certainly can. You can shape the course of history uh, proactively, especially as a society, and you can see these signatures. So, for example, look at this graph here. Uh, and what does it tell you? What happened here, especially around 1925? So the signature here is prohibition, and it certainly had a visible effect on the number of beer brewing firms in the United States. Here you see another graph. That's the average pay of, of bankers at Goldman Sachs between 2009 and 2014. And you can see that the average pay went down after 2009, after the banking bailout crisis, where also the public sector had a lot to say about banking regulation and tighten up the banking regulations. And private sector companies also started to see like, well, maybe it doesn't work as well. That doesn't mean that a 350,000 average salary is still not a lot, but it, it went down after uh, such a big event due to a combination of regulation and private sector strategy as well. Here's an example of digitalization where you can see uh, something must have been different. For example, here's on the x-axis you have the number of telecom subscription per capita on the y-axis you have the installed bandwidth potential that means the number of kilobits per second per capita per inhabitant that are installed and you see here different countries with different income levels the size of the bubble refers to the income level how rich they are and you see for example here one country the slovak republic and another country with a similar income level croatia and you can see even so they have the same income level and the same average band installed bandwidth number of kilobits per inhabitant. Croatia has almost twice as many subscription than the Slovak Republic. So interesting, something different must happen here that doesn't depend on income. It's not like richer countries have more ICT, something else must happen. And if you look up here, there's even Russia and Russia has less income per capita on average has as many ICT subscription as Croatia and has an average bigger bandwidth. So, so there must be something happening here, be it public policy or private strategy. And what do you want to do? You want to look for such differences if you want to identify best practices. Or look at Korea here, kind of like 
you know, running away, way up here. A lot of bandwidth available in Korea. What happened here? Well, that's a result of, of public sector policy. The government was very proactive at laying down a basic fiber optic broadband infrastructure in Korea. Something very similar happened in Japan. And you can see the results of this combination of public policy and private sector strategy. At least you notice that there is something that is not would not happen if you would have left it just by itself because usually you would say well more income must have more connectivity but something else happened here so often if we try to also inform new policy we look for these kind of outliers and once we identify them we dig down and see like what happened here what did they do and the search for best practices and then with that you can inform public policy or also companies can inform themselves to set up more e efficient and effective strategies.